and welcome to uh, the Masterclass series with Mrs. V. And I'm very excited tonight because we have the wonderful Jennifer Bickner. Welcome. Thank you, Scarlett. And Jennifer is a lawyer and a consultant and a speaker. And amazing. I know from personal experience, she has helped me and my family so much. Very grateful. Pleasure. She knows her stuff big time. So I was very thrilled that she could be here and share her wonderful knowledge. And I know that uh, the key part is it's very prevalent at the moment around workplace issues, knowing boundaries and how to have those difficult relationships and conversations, which you're going to start with. Um, so welcome, yes, if you'd like to just tell me a little bit about so they know about you. Okay, well, I have been a lawyer for mm, about 27 years and I started my own business about three years ago because I was frustrated by the fact that I was mainly dealing with disputes. So every day I'd get more and more disputes coming in and I thought, why is this happening? Why are all these lovely people getting sued? <laughs> so I did a bit of an analysis of all my cases and I realised that a lot of the disputes could have been avoided if people had had difficult conversations. They just didn't know how. And um, I did some thinking and I did some research and then six weeks later, I quit my job and started my own business. Awesome. And I've been doing it for the last three years. Yes, yeah, so she's amazing at it. So I'm, I'm very excited to hear this first conversation around how to have challenging conversations, which we all, I know, would appreciate that. If you could expand on that one, please. Well, it's interesting. A lot of people think that they'd rather go to the dentist than have a difficult conversation. Um, but what I find is that if you don't have a conversation here and you let things build up till you get to here, when you explode or when everything hits the fan, it's far, far worse than if you'd had the conversation when the problem was small. And so what I like to say to people is, look, rather than thinking about how scary the conversation is, why don't you think about how good your life is going to be in an hour's time when you've had the conversation, when that thing that's bothering you, that's keeping you up at night or whatever, is over, it's fixed. It is, what, what is the fear that comes up for people in that situation? It depends on the scenario. So yeah. a lot of people are really scared about not being liked. Um, a lot of people have now become friends with their colleagues, or as I call them, colleagues. And it, it, it blurs the lines. And so a lot of people are really scared to pull someone into their office when they know they're going to be going for a drink at the pub with them after work. So the lines are blurred. So there's this real fear of not being liked. The other thing is people are scared of people crying or people yelling or some sort of emotional reaction. But quite often the build-up that they've got in their own mind isn't what's going to happen. It's a perception rather than a reality. And so what I try to say to people is if you do it right, if you have the conversation well and you plan for it, most of the disasters that you're worried about won't happen. And so that's what I try and do with them. I, I help them prepare for the conversation we plan it out. If they're game, they do a role play. Um, just over the phone, I pretend to be the person they're going to talk to and I make them pretend to do it. So it means that when they go into the meeting, they're, they're feeling much more prepared. Wow. Okay. So what is it, have you got an example of what's happened to someone or, you know, um, how they've got through it or any language around it, around that conversation? Look, if I... Um, if I wanted to tell someone that they were behaving in a certain way that upset me, but then I just couldn't do that because it would cause too much disruption through another friend or, yeah, so you're saying to, yeah, so what would I do? Okay, so the first thing to do is plan. So I say to everyone, yeah. sit down and get a piece of paper out and say, right, who is the person I'm dealing with? Because I think we've all become so politically correct that we forget to actually look at the person we're dealing with. Race matters, gender matters, age matters. You actually have to take all of those things into account because the conversation I'm going to have with a 60-year-old is very different to the conversation I'm going to have with an 18-year-old yeah. um, or a male or a female or someone with ethnic considerations. Yeah. So I say sit down and write down a little map of the person that you've got to talk to and then think about, right, what, what is likely to, what are they likely to be receptive to? Um, and, and so really think about the person that you're going to talk to. Yeah. And then, then you have the meeting. And I guess my number one for the meeting is venue. I cannot tell you how many people have difficult conversations in coffee shops. And I'm on a mission to stamp that out. Oh, that's so true. I was actually... I think I've done that too. <laughs> I, I was actually 
in Latteray in the city, having coffee with someone, pitching my difficult conversations workshop, and mid-sentence I looked and there was a girl on the table next to us crying because someone was having a conversation with her behind us. Oh, wow. Awful. The reason why people have conversations in coffee shops is because the person who is delivering the news is gutless. They're scared and they don't want the person who they're talking to to cry or yell or whatever. So they make the person hear the news in public to protect themselves. Right. Oh, Naughty. oh my goodness. But that's very good advice. Very so what I say advice. is it doesn't, doesn't matter where you go as long as it's somewhere that's appropriate. And by appropriate it means you don't have it on the same floor as the rest of the crew if you've got a glass wall conference room. Um, you go somewhere private on the next floor or outside on a park bench. It doesn't matter as long as there's privacy so that the person who you're talking to won't feel like they're going to be embarrassed if someone hears something. Yeah. So pick the right venue. Yeah. Then the next biggest problem I find is that people are just so desperate to get this news off their chests. They just launch into the conversation. Yeah. Like they can't wait to say, you don't know how you make me feel. Yeah. Um, and what I say is, look, just warm up first. You know, sit them down, give them a glass of water, ask about their family, whatever. And then you just say, look, something's come to my attention and I just wanted to have a brief chat with you about it. And if you just say it like that and you're really mindful of the tone, it sends a message to them that you're not angry, that this isn't going to be painful, that you just want to have a chat. And that puts the other person at ease and they're going to be much more receptive to what you've got to say. So you're setting the scene, right? Love that. Mm. Then the next thing is to tell them what the problem is. And my advice is that if, if the problem can't be explained to the person in two or three senses, then you don't actually understand the problem. Oh, that's good. So wow, okay. using the scenario <laughs> that you just gave, yeah. I would say, assuming that you're the person that I'm giving the news yeah. to. So Scarlett, yeah. look, you may not be aware, but yeah. you've been doing ABC. And when you do that, it kind of makes me feel like this. So I just wanted to find out whether you're aware of what you're doing and whether we can have a chat about how we go forward. Right? It's really simple. You're not attacking. Yeah. You're giving them the benefit of the doubt by saying, look, you may not be aware that... Um, and, and it gives them plausible deniability. If they, if they nice. didn't realise they were doing it or if they did but they want to just sort of make good, yeah. th they can say, look, I'm really sorry, I didn't intend to do that. Because most of the time people don't actually in intend to cause offence. It's all accidental. Mm. Um, so if you said that to that person, or sorry, if I said that to you, then I would then shut up and I would let you respond. And I guess the, the other biggest problem I find is that when the other person tries to respond to say, oh, well, look, the reason why I, the, the person who's delivering the bad news overspeaks or tries to finish their sentence or tries to disagree with them before they've even had a chance to speak. Yeah. I think it's really important that the person who's delivering the news just sits there quietly and listens to what the person has said because if they feel that they've had their say, they're far more likely to participate in the joint outcome. So once I mm. heard from you mm. and, and I thought, oh, okay, Scarlett, I didn't realise that you didn't know you were doing this. Well, how about going forward, we agree that, and then you agree on something, and then you say, sure, Jen, and we go, okay, that's a plan. Our plan is to do this, and you, if you need to, you agree to have a follow-up in a week or two if you need to, or you just say, well, let's just see how things go, and maybe we have to have another chat, or maybe we don't. Yeah. But the meeting's over in 10 minutes if you do it properly. It is amazing because the one thing that has been brought to my attention is that people go to work and they think that work is, I mean, work is the number one thing in a way, but it's so much around relationships. Like people kind of go that it's not important in a way, but it's actually like 50% of the role or even more, do you think? But we spend more time with the people we work with than with, than with our loved ones. Mm. So it is really important. And, and that's why I find that employment mm. law is so different is because we're not selling a building or we're not fighting over defects in a car. We're, we're talking about personal relationships. And so when someone loses their job or <clears throat> gets demoted or whatever, it's personal. Yeah. It affects their livelihood. Yeah. Um, like a lot of people when they're giving advice, like giving, telling someone that they're being terminated again, I can't believe people still say that word. <laughs> <laughs> so I always say, what are you? I'm a Schwarzenegger, how's the love you baby? <laughs> Um, it's true. You so say that, that you should say, well, look, we're going to have to let you go. Let go. Or okay. We think it's best for all of us that we go our separate ways or whatever. There's plenty of euphemisms, but you never say you're terminated. Oh, that is a terrible But men, men have to be told that. But 
But what, <laughs> what I try and explain to people is that when you're letting someone go, they don't hear another word after you've told them that news mm. because all they're thinking about is the fact that they can't afford to pay their rent or their mortgage. Mm. And so it's really important when you're mm. giving that bad news that you really prepare for that talk. Um, and you go into it with the language that you want to use. And yeah. it's much easier to have a good outcome when you have a termination if you give the person hope if you give them a chance to save face. I cannot tell you how important it is to save face. And mm. by that I mean... Um, often giving them a chance to resign, giving them a chance to um, agree on the messaging that goes around to their colleagues, um, yeah. helping them find a way to not be embarrassed in front of their spouse or partner or children, whatever. Mm -hmm. Like they, they, it, It's so easy to do a termination well, but it is so easy to do it really, really badly. Oh, amazing advice, incredible advice. Just, I mean, I, I'm never in that situation. Well, I, I have been. And I was actually, I have been, I was so wussy at it. I had to give someone else to do it because I just feel so uncomfortable making people feel bad. And I know that I have to learn how to do that in a better way. And it is, it's hard. Mm. It's hard because there's so much emotionality, which I think is the thing that people struggle with is, you know, what, what is that thing? Why is it so hard? What is the thing that goes, I don't want to make someone feel uncomfortable? Oh, it's just human nature. But... I guess what we've got to do is say, okay, if this is a decision we have to make for the business, we can't afford this person or they're just not suited. Um, and it's actually often better if someone's not suited because you can talk to them about it and you can say, look, I've noticed you just don't really seem really happy. You're always talking about doing blah, blah, blah. And, you know, is your passion somewhere other than here? Because if, if it is, that's okay. We can talk about that. Mm. And, and planting a seed can often be a way to get someone to sort of oh, yeah. think about leaving for themselves. Um, now, of course, there's the whole fair work act that we've got to factor into all of this. And so I guess what I try and say to most of my clients is, look, if we're going to do this, we need to sort of think through whether the yeah. person's likely to take any suggestion that it's not working out as a reason to go on stress leave because that happens. Um, so See, that's stressful. <laughs> I, well, I know it is. That's why I'm yeah. so busy. <laughs> But, but most of the clients that I help sever relationships with their employees, um, it doesn't end up in the tribunals because mm. we do it properly. And by that, I mean, we treat the person with respect. We, we treat them with, we, we, we preserve their face. We preserve their integrity with their family. We, we give them a safety net so that they're not suddenly thinking, oh my God, how am I going to pay the rent? Yeah. Um, we give them some outplacement or some business coaching or whatever they need. And, and often if you've just given them that little gesture of a session with a business coach, that can make all the difference to whether or not they decide to go to fair work or not. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. Yes. And, and it's funny because I think when I went to the person first to kind of go, you're not happy or to try and help her, she burst into tears and said, oh, my God, I want to stay. I know you don't think. And I'm sitting there going, I can't do this. Too. Like, but it's still the problem went on. And that was the difficulty I faced. Um, I couldn't actually resolve it myself. But I think um, it's the language and I had to be stronger. And also understanding the outcome. I mean, what I say to some people, particularly if they've got to deal with their colleagues, their friends who are colleagues, um, is... Think about yourself as wearing two hats. So when you are at the office, you're wearing your manager hat. And when you're at the pub, you're wearing your friend hat. And mm. you just need to put the manager hat on. And, and quite often there's pushback from managers and they say, I don't want to say this. And I say, okay, well, <clears throat> you're a manager, right? You're getting paid to manage. Like the mm. reason you're earning more than the friend you're about to talk to is because you manage the, her, him yeah. and everybody yeah. else. You're actually getting paid extra money to manage. So if you don't do that, you're not going to keep getting paid that manager's salary. And once you make it personal and they realise, okay, it's part of what I signed up for, mm. um, then it, they're more willing to, to do what they have to do. But, but it doesn't have to be the awkward conversation that I think a lot of us dream up in our heads that it's going to be. Yeah, I, and I think I'm, that was probably 10 years ago. So I think now it's a different... And I've had to actually release people in before that now and it's been a different conversation I think I'd, I don't let that closeness come into with people you know enough I think that boundaries the boundaries that's what I've learned you know um lovely love that love that okay so um one more thing before oh, I yes. 
Oh, a really good way to take the personalization out of it is this. Mm. <clears throat> if you're doing a role and the role has a position description that says you are required to do A, B and C. If the person isn't doing A, B and C, when you have the conversation with them, it doesn't have to be personal. It doesn't have to be about their behavior or their attitude or that you don't like them. It's about, look, as you know, your role requires you to do A, B and C. You're not doing these things. We need to talk about that. And so you talk and you take the position description into the meeting with you. It's a piece of paper and no one can argue with it because the person signed up for that job. They know that's their job. And so if you can mm. point to the piece of paper and you're not saying you're a bad person, you're saying you're not achieving this position description, it takes a lot of the emotion out of it and it makes it easier for you to be able to say, look, what if we decide that in relation to point A, we do this, and point B, we do that. And it just takes a lot of the emotion out because you're talking about performing a role rather than the person. Yeah, absolutely. No, I like that. Mm. Very good tip. Thank you, Jen. Amazing. That's okay. Uh, so the next one was, do you need to know um, how to manage discrimination, bullying in the workplace? So, yes, we do. We do. Tell, us, tell us about that. Well, I think we're in a really different time now with all of the, the mm. Me Too and mm. all the, uh, the awareness that's out there, which is great. Um, and there's a truckload of laws that are out there to protect us. But what I tend to say to people is that if you can resolve something informally, in a, satisfactorily but informally, then do it. Because once you crack an egg, it's really hard to put it back together. Mm -hmm. And human nature is what it is. And if you upset someone or accuse someone of something without having explored it informally first, you just go straight to HR, then it, it's going to fracture that relationship with the person that you're going to have to work with. And so that's why I think find, find people that you can talk to, um, Use someone as a sounding board and say, look, this is what's happened. What do you think? Am I overreacting or is this not cool? And then come up with some language about how you can have a conversation with someone informally at first, just to say, look, the other day you did this and I don't think you're aware that you did it or I don't think you intended for it to have this effect on me, but this is how it made me feel. Mm. And it's exactly the same thing as we discussed before. You just gently explain what the issue is <clears throat> Explain how it makes you feel and then let them respond. And if they respond, nine times out of ten, people respond positively. Like, that's what I find is that mm -hmm. people come to me wanting to, you know, go to court. And I'm like, no, have you talked? Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. despite being a lawyer, I hate seeing people go to court because no one wins except me. <laughs> um, so, and, you know, I like having repeat business rather than one-time clients. So I just say to them, look, let's try and find a solution which means that when all this is sorted out, you can still work together. And usually that means having an informal conversation or having an informal word to someone in HR or at least a manager who's close enough in rank to you that it's not going all the way to the top as the first port of call. Yeah, yeah, no, fantastic advice because I think there's so much people kind of assume that things happen. Um, they assume that... Uh, like there's a trigger that happens for people and I think that sets that emotionality off, yeah? There is, but, but often it can be something that builds up over time and so it may be that things happen over time and then all of a sudden there's a the straw that breaks, breaks the camel's back yeah. and you might be quite upset and that's why when it's a good idea to talk to a colleague or a friend and say, look, this has just happened and they might say to you, look, that's actually not a big deal and then you'll realise the reason why you're getting up so upset is because there's been a pattern of behaviour. And that doesn't mean you ignore the pattern of behaviour. It means you recognise there's been a pattern of behaviour that's been going on that you haven't been dealing with. And then you can have an entirely different conversation. Yeah. But often I just really encourage people to sense check with a trusted person who's wise and sage, try, sense check what's going on and say, look, this is what's been happening. What do you think? Yeah. yeah. Um, and it, it just helps you to form a perspective about how to address the problem. Oh, fantastic advice. Fantastic advice, love it. Thank you very much. Uh, now, so what is not okay and what is okay in relationships at work or any place for that matter? Yeah. <laughs> how many hours have we got? <laughs> um, it's a big question. No, look, I mean, I actually say to most people just use the common sense test. Like yeah. it, if it doesn't feel right or look right, then it's not right. Um, anything that makes you feel awkward or uncomfortable or that is unwanted um, is not okay. 
um, doesn't mean you rush straight off to the anti-discrimination board, but it means you do something. Um, and, and I think it's always better to do something when it happens the first time because it's a bit like with the difficult conversations. If you just let these things fester and build up and build up, the, the, the incremental crossing of the line gets worse to the point where the small tap on the shoulder suddenly becomes the hand of the, on the shoulder for longer, which becomes the arm around the waist, which yeah. it, it gets incrementally worse and you hardly notice it because it's happening over time. And so I always say if something uncool happens, call it out when it happens. Yeah. Shut it down. And, yeah. and people don't use humour enough. Like I actually say to people, the best way to diffuse something that's uncomfortable is to make a joke about it. Like, you know, to say, oh, you fell on my shoulder. I'm sure you didn't mean to do that, did you? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Without sort of, you know, yeah. going the serious way. Yeah. No, that's great. And, and humour is a really good way to diffuse something. Again, it gives somebody an out. They can just say, yeah, sorry, fell over. I didn't mean to. Whatever. Yeah. Um, but, but trying to use humour, if you can, reduces the serious nature of what's going on and hopefully means you put it to a stop right there. And I think that was the big thing when we did the talk on the Me Too campaign and did the interview kindly for me, thank you, was, was that thing of um, if it doesn't feel comfortable, then you need to acknowledge that. Um, that was what you said, yeah, which was really helpful. Yeah, and, and like, like sometimes, for example, if it's someone older than you doing it to you, just saying something like, how do you think your wife would feel about that? Or how do you think your daughter would feel about that? And call them out. And, yeah. and, and often that is enough to make a man go, hang on. <laughs> because often when they, they, they don't see you as someone significant in their life, that you're a co-worker. Yeah. But when they think about some other creepy dude doing that to their wife or their daughter, they suddenly become very aware yeah, yeah, that right. the effect of what they're doing is having on another person. Yeah. And obviously it's a very, that's a very big conversation. So you can check out, I'll put a link to the video that Jen talked about that as well. That's a very uh, big topic. Uh, also, now, if you wanted to connect with your business and workplace community in a healthy way, what does that look like? <laughs> um, well, <laughs> um, no, don't. No, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very big <laughs> question, Scarlett. Well, it is that, it's, that, it's the dating at work stuff, isn't it, too? Or... Yeah, I mean, look, a lot of people I know met their partner. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think you've, you've got to use a bit of common sense with that as well. Yeah. Um, there's nothing improper with people falling in love with work or doing other things at work, as long as they're not doing it at work. And as long as the person who, yes. is, the, the more senior person is not in a power relationship and there's no conflict of interest. So yeah. uh, in a lot of the cases where there has been office romances between quite senior people, um, the issue's actually been just the failure to disclose it as opposed to the fact that it happened. Um, oh, okay. So there's been, you know, there was one very, very senior CEO who, um, is still in a relationship with someone um, mm. and he got in trouble not because he was in the relationship because as soon as they started the relationship they stopped working within close proximity he just didn't report it soon enough all right so and again it's just the common sense test it's yeah. just what it does it feel right what, what, what would what would a person looking in think if the, a person i'm in a relationship and i are working on this same project or the a person i'm in a relationship is um, judging my work and giving me pay rises. So it, it's, it's not rocket science. It's just what feels right. So is there anything at work with HR that you're not meant to be? Like, is there anything that can they impose that you can't date at work or patronise with that? <laughs> that illegal? Oh, look, so, some businesses do that, say that. Yeah. Um, but that's usually for business reasons. So there, there yeah. might be, there's usually hopefully, uh, a legitimate reason why it would not be a good idea for you to be in an intimate relationship with someone. And I guess off, off emergency services might be one of those examples where mm -hmm. you wouldn't want to have as your direct partner, your life partner as well, if you're a police officer, for example. So, right. so right. There, I'm sure there's plenty of different roles where it, it's a legitimate safety reason why you shouldn't be involved with your partner. But it makes a good cop show. <laughs> Like a good cop show. <laughs> they do. It's always that tension between the cop and the, you know, the two cops and that. Yeah. Yeah. But look, at the end of the day, there's, there's no, they, they can't legislate against it. But yeah, also, okay. if a company is of the view that you should not go out with people that you work with, you either choose to take the job there or you don't. And yeah. so, you know, I, I, 
I think sometimes we get a little bit too excited about all of these different rules that we hear about. And at the end of the day, we either decide we want to go and work somewhere where they have those strict rules or mm. we don't, or we just date somewhere else other than at work. <laughs> There's plenty of options. Plenty. Now, I just want to digress now mm -hmm. just to the dating scene. Um, another thing Jen has been very kindly doing for her uh, you know, immediate family and friends, which I'm blessed to be one of, is talking about marriage at first sight. I have been writing a daily blog. <laughs> is it your is your site public? No, it's not. No, public. no, oh, it's, it's, it's just a bit of fun. Um, I love it, and she's been so. She does a bit of a recap on it, and it's so funny for you because you deal with relationships on the that legal side. What is the tone like? Just just very briefly to talk about tone or why? What is yeah the tone that you use around that and why? Well. Married at first sight is like my guilty pleasure. And, <laughs> and a lot of people sort of question why someone would watch that show. A lot of, my partner included, he, he refuses to watch it. Um, but, but I deal with people in anguish all day. I deal yeah. with employers or employees who are having a really bad time all day. My phone doesn't stop ringing. I'm yeah. constantly trying to put broken relationships back together. And so at night, I want to watch something completely mindless. Mm -hmm. And... That show is mindless. <laughs> but I'm actually fascinated by the psychology of it all yeah. because I'm, I'm fascinated by the fact that people go on the show. I'm fascinated that they allow themselves to be filmed, saying and doing the things they do. It's true. I um, know. Amazing. And it's just one giant soap opera. And so with the stuff I write about it, it's it's fun. I'm, I'm not, I, don't, I don't pick on any of the girls because that, that's not cool. Um, I do pick on the, the nasty boy. <laughs> so but, but, but it's all tongue in cheek. It's all fun. Yeah. It's not, it's not, you know. So what is the, what is the one thing that you've learned from watching it? <laughs> is there something or one? Uh, apart from don't go on a reality show. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? What is it? Um, if, look, watching reality shows make you feel better about yourself. That, like, yeah. um, it's made me um, respect and love and adore my partner more. <laughs> um, take him less for granted. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, look, it, it's, it's all just fun, really. It is. I mean, the psychological <laughs> side is very interesting. I mean, I mean, I love watching it because I'm, I'm a Game of Thrones obsession person and so I'm fascinated. But I love that for the same Henry, reason. But it's, it's the psychology. It's the psychology of going, what they're doing and they become so real and I love even watching the makers that do the storyline because they're often driven by the fans and the expectations and it's like a collaboration mm. of writing, really. It's really interesting how that goes and the psyche and the reality shows. And I know some of it's kind of scripted, but it's, um, but it's also, I think how they do it, they just set it up and see what happens. So they, yeah, they, they throw the things in, they yeah. suggest a lot. But no one's, no one's putting a gun to their head and making them say the things that no. they say. It's coming out of their mouths. But, but I mean, yes, it's fun, but... I, I was a waitress for seven years while I was oh, at no. school and uni. Yeah. And if I was Prime Minister, I would make it <laughs> law that every person who, um, when they leave school, not, not compulsory army service, there would be compulsory restaurant or retail service. Yes. Because I think that the skills you learn yes. working in retail or in hospitality give you mm. the ability to deal with people problems better than anything else does. Yeah, and, and by the time I finished law school, there wasn't a single type of dickhead that I hadn't had to deal with in the restaurant <laughs> or in a shop. Um, yeah. And it gave me great confidence and insights into how to deal with people. And yeah. so to that end, I'm going to say that Married at First Sight is just a further part of my education <laughs> in understanding the psychology of people. I love it. I love it. You should look, if you're able to read it, I mean, it's, um, it's very funny and I love the commentary. So thank you for enjoying it. And thank you, Jen, for all that wonderful information because uh, there are some wonderful nuggets in there and just for people, it's so obvious to you because you deal with it every day, but for those who don't, it's like a, a little wake-up call. Mm. I mean, I just, one takeaway would be don't box with shadows, right? Mm. Whenever, when you, whenever you've got to do something that's horrible or you think is horrible, ask yourself what is the worst thing that can happen because yeah. it's usually never as bad as you think it is. Yeah. And then ask yourself, how good will it be if this thing that's bothering me doesn't happen anymore? Yeah. yeah. And then do it. I love it. 
Beautiful advice. So if you want to know more about Jen and work with Jen, who I highly advise, amazing. And she also does speaking as well, incredible workshops around in organizations to help any around bullying or having difficult conversations. She does like a role play and a whole thing. She's very entertaining. So they're amazing workshops. I'll leave the link below so you can have a look. And um, she'll be back on short, so thank you very much. My pleasure. I have to go home and watch Married at First Yes, <laughs> I know. I was so upset for her because she was missing it. <laughs> Good night, everyone. We'll Good see night. you next week. Bye.